So good morning everybody. Hello and welcome. Uh, welcome to today's uh, Boston webinar together with Asperitas. My name is Wolfgang Stief. I'm your host for today. Um, before we start, I want to make a little bit of housekeeping. The webinar will be recorded and will be published afterwards on YouTube. And we will send to everybody a link for the YouTube recording afterwards. And then uh, the presentation will take approximately half an hour, 40 minutes, something around. And we will have a Q&A part at the end. For questions, please uh, use the GoToMeeting chat you have. Um, and address the questions to the group organizers only, because other groups are not monitored by us. So uh, only questions uh, which uh, pop up in organizers only chat uh, will be seen from us, and uh, which will try to handle the questions throughout the presentation. And uh, as I said, we will have a dedicated Q&A part at the end so uh, that we try to address at least uh, some of your questions. Most probably we won't be able to cover all questions, but uh, we will collect the questions, of course, and um, may come back to you further on or um, maybe even answer the questions directly via chat. So now with me here, <coughs> It's uh, on the one side, Georg, Georg Klauser is, uh, in, is the CEO of uh, Boston, Germany, Boston Server Solutions, Solutions. And I also have here with me, um, Rolf Brink. He is the CEO of Asperitas. So, um, Georg, maybe just introduce yourself briefly and uh, what is your connection to Asperitas? Sure, good morning, everyone. My name is Georg Klauser. I'm the managing director of Boston in Germany and Switzerland. And a um, little bit of background about me. Um, I'm 16 years now in the industry and my background is business informatics. You ask for the reason why we are working with Asperitas. That's a simple reason. Um, we at Boston believe that there is a need to think about cooling IT equipment differently today. And Asperitas is a high-tech company exactly specialized on that. They have a fantastic technology to cool IT equipment in the way we think it should be cooled today. Boston is 26 years on the market now, and we had always been following a first-to-market strategy and brought cutting edge high performance and mission critical servers and storages to the market. So for us, it was just a natural fit to also think about how these systems can be cooled most efficiently to get the most out of the systems. And the award-winning immersed computing technology from Aspractus was the answer. Thank you. So Rolf, what about you? Might you uh, mind to introduce yourself a little bit? And why are you working with Boston? Uh, yes, of course. Well, thank you. Um, so my name is Rolf Brink. I'm CEO of Asperitas, uh, also uh, one of the two founders. Um, we have been in touch with Boston for quite some time already. We got introduced by, uh, 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 by Supermicro, in fact. Um, and we, uh, during the time that we've been working together, we have also discovered that Boston is one of the uh, uh, higher-end IT integrators uh, in the market today. Uh, Boston is present uh, pretty much around the globe, uh, and their eye for for high quality uh, and availability in whatever they build is quite excellent, and that fits very well with our strategy. Um, the cutting edge technology focus uh, is something that is very that that, is, that goes hand to hand with what the spirit is does. This, this allows for a very high level of integration of technology, uh, both on the IT equipment side and the immersion technology side. Boston has a very long background in liquid technologies, uh, which, which actually results in, uh, in a very good view on what should or should not be done with liquids uh, in, custom, in customer situations, in data centers, and how you can maximize the efficiency of liquid technologies. Um, basically, Boston gets our technology very well, and they're able to build upon it, uh, which is why this uh, collaboration between Boston and Aspiritas is highly strategic in nature, but also very beneficial towards the market and our customers. So thank you. 
Um, at the recent CloudFest, I think end of March in Germany, uh, Boston Aspirit has launched several new integrated platform solutions uh, optimized for liquid cooling. So in this webinar, we will connect to the CloudFest launch and discuss those highly energy efficient solutions in some more detail. Rolf, for the beginning, can you explain a bit more about what immersed cooling actually is? Yes, of course. Um, uh, obviously, that was uh, prepared. Um, what Asperitas does is quite unique. Yeah? So we uh, we look at immersion as a basic technology, uh, immersion cooling, uh, which is essentially the complete immersion of IT in a dielectric liquid. Um, our technology is completely uh, is fully developed for high temperature water cooling, which means that you can work without any chillers and immersion in general addresses uh, IT continuity in several unique ways. Uh, first of all, there's no oxygen getting in touch with components, which means that there is no, ox no oxidation of any of the electronics or the components that are used in a server. Uh, due to the very high heat capacity of liquid, uh, you're drastically reducing the effects of thermal shock. Um, and that same heat capacity allows for very high density computing. Uh, and it also means that we don't need any air displacement within the chassis. Uh, that is also a power saving, uh, simply because you, you, can, you can exclude fans from the equation. Uh, the unique nature of our immersion technology uh, is the fact that we apply passive circulation. Now, in order to cool a heat generating component like a CPU or a GPU or any other chip that is providing heat, um, you, need to part, you need to move a medium past it. Uh, and therefore, you normally require a flow of some kind. And we generate this flow uh, by utilizing gravity and the heat that is being produced by those same components. Um, the way it works is actually shown in that uh, in the graph on the left of the screen. Uh, the IT components warm up the liquid, which makes the liquid want to rise, uh, so uh, the liquid will want to float. Uh, and on both sides of the IT, within the same body of liquids, we have placed or water cooled uh, convection drives, uh, which are essentially a, type, a specialized type of heat exchanger. Uh, where we uh, uh, where we where we reject the heat from the liquid uh, into a water circuit, uh, and by doing so, we generate a higher density, which makes the liquid want to sink, and therefore we get a natural convection circulation mechanism. Now, this is so effective, so efficient that we can use very high densities in the solution, and the elegant uh, nature of this means that uh, it regulates itself. Uh, the more power you put in, the faster it flows, the less you put in, the less happens. And therefore, there's no control mechanism required uh, and nothing that you need to implement that may fail over time because there is no moving parts. No moving parts also means no maintenance, no vibration, no, uh, uh, and so therefore it reduces all the uh, failure potential of IT, um, which results in longer lifetimes. So, Rolf, um, and how does this relate to an air-cooled rack? How, how can we look at this? Right, so the, the, the systems that we manufacture and that we deploy together with Boston have the exact same physical footprint size as a 19-inch rack. So, first of all, in square meters, the size of the solution is identical to a 19-inch rack. However, there are some major differences in, in the utilization of, uh, of a system like this. So I've made a comparison between air infrastructures and uh, an immersion based on asparagus technology. Um, so if you look at an air cold rack, uh, an average deployment of an air system right now in an average data center that you can walk into. Uh, so nothing specialized yet. Uh, on average, we're looking at a design capacity for a data center of approximately five kilowatts per rack. Uh, and if you translate, if that, uh, if that data center is fully equipped, completely filled, you can calculate that to a white space density figure of approximately three and a half kilowatts per square meter. That is uh, something that we call the solution footprint. 
Um, normally, commonly, you could potentially cool that with 32 degrees Celsius air temperature, which means you can make a very efficient data center environment with dry coolers and adiabatic cooling. This is what the larger scale data centers and highly efficient data centers are doing with low CAPEX and low PoEs of about 1.15. Now, if you want to raise that bar to meet the current day IT standards with the current chip levels, yeah, so, uh, both Intel and AMD have all, have all released new chips in the last few years, and uh, they have recently released, uh, again, a new, uh, a new line of chips, uh, and that's going to push that power bar upwards to at, the, at least around 10 kilowatts that you need to be able to deal with in a data center. Um, first, first thing that's going to happen is that the allowable temperature, air temperature in your facility is going to go down to pretty much a maximum of 27 degrees Celsius. And there might be ways of doing it differently. Yeah, but commonly, this is already a challenging approach. Uh, you are going to be requiring a mix of adiabatic cooling and chillers, which means that your energy consumption is actually going up, your overall energy consumption, because your overhead is going to go up because you need to facilitate chillers, but also your CAPEX is going up. Chillers are expensive, and therefore your PUE also goes up. It goes to approximately 1.25. Um, if we look at the challenges that our market is actually dealing with today and tomorrow, and this is also what ASHRAE recently published the white paper about, uh, um, we're going to be more and more challenged on what you can do in a rack. If you're looking at 15 kilowatts or higher racks, oh, there are racks out there, 30, even 40 kilowatts if necessary, but the environment around it that you need to build to sustain that type of density that means you're going to be fully dependent on fully chilled water circuits with a maximum tolerance of around 17 degrees Celsius. With very high capex, high PUE, you're going to require in-row cooling strategies, which actually drives down your density per square meter on your white space. And therefore, you're going to, you're going to, be, uh, you're going to get stuck around 10 kilowatts per square meter. Now, this is where immersion uh, starts playing a whole different game and a whole different ball game. Uh, the standard deployments that we're doing right now, and this is also in line with one of the uh, one of the um, platform solutions that you guys recently positioned uh, at CloudFest, that we jointly positioned at CloudFest recently, we're looking at 20 kilowatts a rack. Uh, that translates to approximately 14 kilowatts per square meter. Um, we are look actually looking at a temperature tolerance of up to let's say 45 degrees Celsius. All these platforms, uh, for example, the AMD-based platforms, they're tolerant to about 45 degrees Celsius or higher. That means that wherever you are, uh, in most areas of the world, you can cool this with dry coolers alone. You don't need chillers. And that is an incredible saving, both on CAPEX uh, and OPEX. Uh, so I've, I've left out the OPEX remark, but PUE relates to OPEX as well. It's an indicator. We can, we can bring that down to, a, to around 1.05. That's the effect of immersion cooling. Um, if you raise that bar to 34 kilowatts with the upcoming CPUs, uh, the, 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 new, the next generation, the next Intel generation that's coming up with chips going towards 400 watts, uh, we can still facilitate that with at least 32 degrees Celsius water, potentially higher. Uh, which is still feasible to run with dry coolers and adiabatics, at least in, the North, in Northern Europe. But it still allows the low CAPEX and, uh, and PoE effect. And these densities can only be achieved with immersion technology. And to, to illustrate the cost effect, uh, because uh, we're all talking about CAPEX reduction, OPEX reduction, and instead of going into a whole complex range of numbers, I decided to just to get this graph on the screen for you guys, or, or, or this, this, uh, this model. This is an actual model of an existing data center. Uh, it's a large data center. Uh, th this represents a part, of that facility, a part of the data center that is running at 1.2 megawatts. An air, an air cooled data center. On the, that's what you see on the left. You see the white space, you see the facility area, you see the, the gen sets and the, and the chiller plants. 
it's all there. On the right side, you see the exact same compute capacity, the exact same digital environment in an immersed computing environment. Uh, that's running uh, with a PoE of 1.09. And if you look at everything that's built around it, you get a visual impression of what that cost saving looks like. Because that facility is now reduced to essentially a bunch of switch gear, some UPS infrastructure, to two smaller gensets and a few small dry coolers. So that physical footprint is drastically reduced and the simplicity of the facility as well. And the way that we can achieve this is by compressing the IT into a one-use space. So if you look at the type of server designs that we developed together also with Boston, we're looking at highly consolidated server designs. We can fit a lot more compute into a one-use space. We use specialized chassis for liquid. We optimize that liquid. Uh, uh, the designs for liquid and that allows us to get to these much higher densities even though the uh, uh, we're losing about half the uh, three-dimensional space because we're using vertical uh, uh, vertical position servers uh, we can still achieve a lot higher densities than anything else that you can do with air so Georg um, how does this fit into the Boston strategy in the Boston portfolio? Because, I mean, you are not a liquid cooling company at all, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're not a liquid cooling company. Our core competence is to tailor-made IT solutions with fulfill exactly the requirements of the customer's needs. We offer turnkey solutions. So we validate, integrate, build, install, test and ship solutions. For us, it was clear that we need to bring those two worlds together and combine the immersed cooling technology from Asperitas with our solutions and again, bring them to market as ready to go turnkey solutions. So what you see here on the next slide is our application centric solution range. So you see four systems here in our portfolio, ranging from general purpose systems up to high performance computing systems. <clears throat> Again, as for all of our platforms, you get absolute freedom of choice here. That means no matter if you wanna go with Intel CPUs or AMD CPUs, if you wanna add in, um, NVIDIA GPUs, uh, there is a solution there to address your needs. If we look a, a little bit more into detail of the different solutions, <clears throat> we start with our general purpose system made for any type of cloud applications and platforms, uh, which is uh, in that case here, AMD based. So it's based on the current AMD Epic platform. So we see here the um, Asperitas box, the AIC24, can actually take 24 server slats. So 24 dual socket server slats can go into one cassette. So here, um, because we're using a dual socket motherboard, you end up having 48 CPUs in one box. So that's a bit more than 1,500 compute cores. And um, you have close to 50 terabyte of memory and close to a petabyte of storage. And that's all in one box. Depending on your application, you can achieve up to 30% CPU performance improvement. How we do that is by uh, enabling the turbo mode of the um, CPUs, which in air, in that high density, um, would, be, uh, would be quite a challenge. <clears throat> Moving forward to the next one. Um, so again, this is um, based on the current AMD Epic platform. Um, 
but we just increase the density. So instead of using two CPUs per slot here, we're using four. So that means instead of the 48 CPUs what we saw before, we have 96 now inside the box. So that comes now to a bit more than 3,000 cores, uh, close to 100 terabyte of memory. And uh, again, um, in that case here, uh, 768 terabyte of storage. And again, turbo mode can be enabled here and uh, you will see the maximum performance in terms of uh, the CPU. The Max platform is optimized for GPU compute. So here we use um, NVIDIA's GPUs. So um, we're using an Intel um, platform here. So it's a dual socket um, Intel scalable platform. But here we added three GPUs per slat. So three times 24 comes to 72 GPUs in one cassette. So in addition to the uh, a bit more than 1,000 CPU cores, we now have more than 330,000 CUDA cores, or in other words, 8.3 petaflops of uh, additional GPU computational power. And uh, here that uh, platform uh, can improve uh, up to 40% in terms of the CPU performance by using turbo mode. And last but not least, we are looking at the uh, general purpose uh, system here, which is um, Intel based. So we're using the uh, current Intel um, scalable platform. And um, again, here, uh, 24 servers inside the cassette with 48 CPUs and um, 1,000 compute cores close to petabyte of storage and, uh, of course, uh, 48 terabyte of memory. So these platforms are actually running at uh, at the highest possible efficiency. Yeah? So uh, all these server systems, all these server designs are working without any fans, without any overhead energy. Uh, and they're inserted in a device which can cool with very high temperature, uh, very, fi very high cooling temperatures. Um, so this is not only about high efficiency, uh, this also goes towards future proving. Now, I would like I'd like to get into that a little bit more, uh, and that's because, especially here in Europe, we've got a society challenge towards uh, getting away from gas. Uh, so we, we're in the middle of an energy transition, and data centers are under high pressure to start looking at ways to deliver heat uh, to some kind of a heat grid. Now. These solutions are already optimized from, from the chip design all the way to the server design, solution design, and the whole platform design. They're already geared for high temperature operation. And these systems, we can run at very high temperatures, which means that we can actually generate very warm output temperatures, very high output temperatures from these systems. Um, so to allow you to get a bit of an impression, uh, and these figures may not mean a lot to most of the attendants, uh, to most of the attendees of this uh, uh, webinar, but feel, but take these figures out, uh, take these figures away with you, punch them in Google, and and do some research on this by yourself, because this is actually some one of the things that is going to make a massive difference in the upcoming three years. Heat is more valuable than power. Uh, you can look that up yourself. Look for the price of heat, the price of a gigajoule today. And this is where these systems are fully future-proof. These systems are completely developed and ready for the challenges of tomorrow. Right now, they're aimed at highest efficiency, but they are already capable of delivering constant output temperatures 
uh, for potential uh, uh, synergy scenarios and, and the next generation of data centers, which you'll all hear about a lot more in the upcoming few years. All right. So um, our current immersed computing portfolio, as I just mentioned earlier, is application centric. So we try to address most of the use cases out there. With that lineup, we offer the highest efficiency possible today with the lowest IT and facility power. We enable you to reduce the facility requirements. As Rolf mentioned earlier, um, there is no need anymore for chillers and other stuff. Um, so facility requirements are reduced. Also, maintenance is minimized as well because of the efficient way we're cooling. And another beauty is that deploying such a system can, hap can happen really rapidly with four hours of commissioning time. And that's because all of the hardware is pre-configured and everything self-contained. It is really a plug and play solution, even though it's actually a, a, a complex system, um, but it's a turnkey solution, as uh, you know any other of our um, Boston Turnkey solutions. Asperitas really solved us a big issue here uh, with the immersed computing technology, um, because we, we can cool every component in the same way. And that is and that exactly where the heat is actually generated. So all the IT equipment is is cooled in in the same way um, at exactly the the hotspot where the heat is is generated. And that's to me a really smart solution. Okay. So Rolf, um, what makes this solution so robust and reliable? Is it really that safe? We immerse uh, systems uh, to immerse systems in the liquid. Oh, that's that. That is a great question, uh, and and the, uh, this is supposed to be a technical deep dive. So um, uh, why not just do exactly that? So, um, I this is highly focused on something that we call certification process. Um, uh, it, it, it's something that we're uh, promoting in the industry as well as part of something that needs to happen uh, because immersion by itself is something that has to be taken very seriously. Uh, not because everybody will need it, uh, not only because of that, uh, not in the sense that you have to take it seriously to, uh, to put it in a data center, even though that's very relevant as well. But it's also relevant to consider the, whole ramific the full ramifications of server design when you're dealing with immersion. Um, and this is something that we do uh, quite well. This is, some, this is something that we build up as an expertise along the way that's always been part of our vision. Uh, IT needs to be designed for liquids. Uh, if you look at an average off-the-shelf server, which is sold as uh, to be implemented in a 19-inch rack, and you open it up, you will instantly notice that it's never been designed for immersion it's been designed to operate in an air-cooled environment. It's got spaces for air to move through, which are not always suitable for liquid. Uh, thin spacing of heat sinks are designed for air, not for liquid. And so one of the first things we do is we set a goal to outperform any air-based design or system uh, uh, when, we, uh, when we look at a new server design. And we look at extending the lifetime and, inc and drastically increasing the efficiency. Uh, and we do that with uh, a research focused on reliability and that continuity. Which starts with a feasibility study. We just make sure that whatever we come up with uh, together with Boston or what, what Boston comes up with very often as well. Um, and we start validating whether that's even feasible to do. Uh, to see if that mainboard is suitable, the components are suitable, if the thermodynamics play, uh, uh, actually play out the way that we want it to play out. And then we start engaging with prototyping, and that's when we also start doing component compatibility checks. We're talking about liquid immersion. It's uh, any liquid immersion system deals with chemicals. Uh, in our case, 
also. Uh, we're using medicinal quality oil. It's all nice and well, but and it's very safe to work with, but still it's classified as chemical and it reacts with certain materials as well. And we investigate that, we know what it reacts with, and we make sure that we do the homework to validate that. Uh, uh, in addition to that, we do a 10-day certification run where we really abuse the system, test out, validate the maximum tolerances, uh, and then we have a baseline for a long-term test, which lasts 100 days for any system before it gets released into, the, uh, into a customer deployment, in which we fully investigate all the effects of liquid on the electronics. Uh, and that goes pretty deep. So uh, on the next slide, I've, I've prepared a few examples of that. Uh, what is important to mention here is that this process is, uh, includes uh, Boston, Supermicro, AMD, and Intel, and many more uh, uh, brands, but manufacturers in the industry. We work together with these manufacturers to do these te this testing and this validation. And the result of this is a very predictable server behavior. We always have the longest running configuration in our tech center, technology center here in Haarlem in the Netherlands. Uh, so anything that might occur on any customer premises should occur first in our facility. We keep testing all the systems we've ever developed to the maximum capacity in our facility. Now I mentioned component compatibility. Uh, uh, on this slide, you get to see a whole bunch of pictures. Um, some of them uh, are difficult to, to identify, but that's on purpose. Um, what we do with that component validation, we take that pretty far. Uh, we get engineering samples from manufacturers to work with, and we make sure that they know, that they are aware that the testing process that we make it go through is is very destructive in nature. So on the left side, you see uh, a CPU that we literally pull apart to, make, to, figure, to investigate how it responds to being in, an, in a liquid environment. In this case, that is a, a past uh, certification. That uh, it doesn't come apart very easily. It breaks when you do so. Uh, there's nothing that is being uh, uh, compromised by liquids. And we do this the same way with other components as well on the main board, board and, and we document, we fully document that process and the research on this. We make some modifications where necessary, uh, uh, tin materials, uh, uh, the thermal interface materials, sometimes they are soft in nature, and in that case, we usually replace them with two purposes, to increase, uh, to increase the thermal uh, conductivity of these surfaces, because that they're not always specifically required, but we're always aimed at optimizing that thermal capability. Uh, and sometimes it means that we add a little piece of electronics, for example, to uh, power supplies, which are often not designed to op be operated without fans. Uh, we have a uh, we have a small fan simulator that we can attach to the power supplies, uh, or we raise the temperature tolerance of the power supplies. Uh, we optimize heat sinks, for example, for liquids, uh, but sometimes we also run into, uh, we do run into uh, uh, certain components that are actually not compatible with liquids, which causes a disqualification. And this doesn't happen very often, but when it does, we always capture it. And so on the right side, you see uh, a semiconductor that has, that has literally disintegrated. Uh, you can see some components that after testing, uh, they actually have reacted with the liquid and they start overheating. Now, these things we capture and we exclude these components from any server build that we create. We make sure together with the manufacturers that whatever we assemble together with Boston, that it's tolerant and actually very suitable for immersion in liquid. Uh, and that's also stressed by the duration test. Uh, so here you see... Uh, a, a very small part of this full certification documentation. This is actually a certification from one of these servers that we've actually uh, positioned. Uh, I believe this is the 4 CPU AMD solution. Uh, so the, 90, the 96 uh, AMD CPUs from the top of my head. 
Now, this has been sitting in uh, immersed environment for 10 weeks, and you see a lot of fluctuations in the graphs, and those, every fluctuation is an action that we've performed. So that system has been extracted, reinserted, taken apart, fully disassembled, fully reassembled, uh, has seen uh, at least 20 full system boots, uh, uh, boot cycles, but also 100 physical power off and on cycles. By the, C, by the PDU outlet, which we can control. So very fast switching of the power supply to make sure that that will last. All these type of tests are part of our standard approach before even releasing a server towards a customer. Yeah, so that does address uh, a very high value towards OEMs. Yeah, exactly. So, these certification values, what Rolf just described, is key for us because we need to make sure that we continue to provide you guys with the highest reliable systems as you used to receive them from us. Based on that intensive certification process, which um, Rolf just walked you through, we are able to provide solutions which are perfectly optimized for immersed cooling. And because of the technology we use here, it allows you to get the highest performance possible out of the platforms. And of course, it's all nicely wrapped up with the standard services, which you typically get from Boston. So it's based on our uh, standard Boston quality, um, high standards. Um, it's, it comes with full warranty. Um, it's all backed up and um, supported by the, manu by the manufacturers. Uh, you can have the um, services around it, um, what we typically offer. So integration service, on-site uh, servant services in um, different flavors. Um, so it's, it's really um, completely comparable to any other um, turnkey solution you get from us um, with all the um, services around it. So I'm quite impressed. That all sounds uh, pretty amazing. Um, what we now have seen is all things you can buy right now. They are available in the market. Um, but I'm pretty sure you have some more things uh, to tell about the future. So what are you working on? What are you developing? Oh yeah, uh, we keep ourselves busy. Um, so, like I said many times now, Boston had always been following a first-to-market st strategy. So for us, it's key to bring the latest and greatest te te technologies at first to market. So, of course, um, this year is a is a big year in terms of uh, new launches. So um, we just saw a couple of days back the launch of the second generation Intel Xeon Scalable family, codename uh, Cascade Lake. Um, in our Boston labs, we have been playing around with the um, CPUs already quite a while. Now our aim is, is of course, to um, have everything ready for you guys that uh, you can pick up on the latest um, Te technology as soon as it comes out. So um, we're optimizing the platforms for the second generation Intel. And then later in the year, uh, in Q3, we're going to see the AMD Epic launch of, of their um, Rome architecture. So that's the second generation of uh, Rome then. That's um, still... Um, a bit time to go, but um, again, um, we have uh, systems already in our labs. The engineers are playing around with it um, to make sure that um, when the market launch comes, we're ready. And the same thing applies to um, the GPU side of things. Um, we thought that uh, it's a good idea to focus on an even higher density GPU offering because there is an increasing demand of um, AI and deep learning 
applications as well as um, HPC um, platforms. So based on the latest um, NVIDIA Tesla GPUs, the Walter architecture, um, we are designing new solutions based on that, which are then, for instance, optimized for uh, training to and um, inference in terms of um, AI and deep learning workloads or for HPC um, workloads, which is a um, very common um, area for us as well, uh, since Boston is more than 20 years in that um, field of HPC. And then the third area we're going to be focusing on is storage, because we say what we can do with um, compute that can also be done with storage. Of course, you saw in the current portfolio already that, that, uh, that there is a nice portion of storage um, in it, um, close to a petabyte of storage just in one box. Um, but we said that can't be the limit and we're working on um, ways to um, even get more storage and a higher density built into the solutions. Okay, so thank you. I think this was the presentation so far. Um, we already have some questions here. So we could, we'll just jump into the Q&A section right now. First question is addressed to Rolf. Rolf, is it possible to tell us a bit more about the actual type of liquid being used for those solutions? Uh, yes, of course, Lewis. Um, we use uh, hydrocarbon-based liquids, which uh, for people who are not familiar with the chemical re reference, uh, it relates to oil, uh, but not just any type of oil. It's not, uh, it's not like the motor oil you would put in your car engine. Uh, instead, it's uh, a highly pure, a high purity type of oil, which is synthetic, which means that it's manufactured uh, on a molecular level. Uh, we have a strategic R&D relationship also with Shell, one of the biggest menu oil manufacturers in the world, uh, and their labs are continuously improving these type of liquids and now also for the, for the explicit purpose of immersion technology. Uh, the, the reference name for the type of oils that we use is GTL, which stands for gas to liquid, uh, which is something that Shell but in particular is very uh, big in. Uh, and that, uh, that allows us to benefit most from the highest purity and also the highest performance uh, in relation to the liquid. Okay. Thank you. Another question I have here for Georg. Georg, all of the solutions presented to us today are based on certain customer cases. Could you a little bit more elaborate on that? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, everything is um, application Centric and each solution um, is based on our on our uh, actual um, customer case where we try to really optimize best for the um, needs and the demands of of, um, of of various projects and it's um, all designed for for different type of organizations. So uh, it might be enterprise or more cloud type uh, service organization or uh, the field of high performance computing. But we always try to keep the application in mind and focus to build the perfect solution for a specific um, scenario. Okay. So if, I, if I might elaborate on that, it's, uh, so, so, so some of these solutions are actually deployed for uh, uh, enterprise level environments. Uh, hypervisor environments are being used currently uh, based on some of these architectures. Uh, we're talking about HPC, uh, pure uh, uh, CPU based uh, high performance computing. Uh, uh, we're talking about an AI platform uh, for customers. Um, so these systems are actually being used. Uh, the design of these systems is based on actual customer deployments and customer scenarios. Okay, thanks. Um, another question I have here is um, maybe both of you can answer uh, from your standpoint. Is it possible to visit a data center where those solutions are in operation? Probably Georg first. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Rolf. Of 
Yeah. There yeah, is so it's, uh, uh, we, we've currently in the rollout uh, uh, process of our um, project here in um, Germany, where we agreed with the customer that um, that site can also be used as a um, location where people can actually see the system in production. We are also working on um, the same thing in the UK. And I believe for all of you guys in the Netherlands, you have uh, even um, better possibilities to actually uh, demo the solution live. Yes, that is correct. There are several deployments actually that we can uh, uh, allow uh, customer visits with. Uh, not all of them. Uh, some of our deployments are highly confidential in nature, which is uh, sadly common in this industry. Which, uh, but uh, yeah, we ha we have uh, deployments that can be visited, data centers that can be visited in uh, in the Netherlands, in France, in Austria, in Germany. Well, we mentioned Germany and and the UK already. Um, First thing to do if anybody wants to go and visit one of these deployments to see how it operates in reality, how it how it runs production, uh, just contact either Boston or Asperitas directly, uh, and we'll be able to facilitate the visit. Uh, the most exciting part is to visit to our technology center where we do all the really exciting stuff, where we do everything that we don't allow our customers to do. So that's uh, <laughs> that, that's always interesting. Yeah, that's for sure. Okay. So it looks that there are no more further questions, which uh, brings me to the end of this presentation. In case uh, you want to know some more on the solutions, please don't hesitate to contact uh, the colleagues at the Boston, which uh, the contact information is here on uh, the current uh, slide. Rolf and Georg, thanks to you. Thanks for your presentation, for your insights. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Yep, I'm here. So thanks everybody for spending the time with us. Um, have a nice day, have a nice weekend. Uh, see you the next time. Goodbye.